Got your Bibles? Uh, we're going to be looking at two verses chapter of chapter 86 of the book of Psalms today. Verses 12 and 13. So let's pray and we'll get started, okay? Father God, we thank you for uh, your message today. God, we pray that uh, the message would be from you and not from me, God. We thank you for your word today, for your words are truth to us. And Lord, as we come today, we come with one purpose in mind, and that is to worship you. So let us remove every distraction. God, let us concentrate totally on you today. And we, Father, we pray that what we say and do would lift the precious and wonderful name of Jesus. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I've got a question for you today. And Jeff, you can't answer it, but I want the rest of them to answer it. <laughs> What is the primary purpose of the church? What is the primary purpose of the church? Spread the gospel. Anybody else want to suggest something? Nobody? Discipleship. Discipleship. That's, that's basically what uh, David said. Well, I'm going to give you three purposes that I believe, and, and the main purpose, I'm going to give you the main purpose first, and then I'm going to give you two additional purposes for the church, okay? First and main purpose of the church is to worship God. When we come into this house, this building, we should come with one thing in mind, and that is to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The second purpose is to make disciples what you said and what you said. The third purpose is to perfect the saints. You see, the purpose of the church, once we make disciples and we come to worship God, then we need to perfect people into Christ's likeness, don't we? So today, as we continue our study on the heart, I want to talk to you today about a heart of worship. Today's verse comes out of chapter 6 of the Psalms, verses 12 and 13. Listen to David's writing here. He says, I will praise you, O Lord, my God, with all of my heart. I will glorify your name forever. For great is your love toward me. You have delivered me from the depths of the grave. You know, Wednesday night, uh, it, I told Jeff earlier, I said, it's amazing how God puts our lessons and his sermons together sometimes. Wednesday night, Jeff was speaking to us about the spiritual disciplines of the Nazarene church because we've been talking about what the Nazarene church believes on Wednesday nights. So Wednesday night, Jeff told us that one of the spiritual disciplines of the Nazarene church is meaningful worship. And I wanna to read to you something that he shared with us this week that we as Nazarenes are supposed to do when we gather for meaningful worship, okay? And, and I, this, this is just amazing because it's basically what I'll, I'll be talking to you about today. But he said the Nazarene church believes these things. He says that worship inspires us and releases the power of God in our life. Worship reorients our lives to that of Christ. It is an imperative spiritual discipline for all believers used by God to shape us into the holy image of Jesus. He goes on and, he's, and it says, we must make both personal and corporate worship consistent practices within our lives. Next, we must be willing to stop our agendas and allow God time to complete his agenda among us Meaningful worship makes room for God to move freely as we wait for Him with expectation. We should come to every worship gathering with the anxious anticipation that God will meet us in that gathering and move among us. We must anticipate God to move in very obvious ways to do what God only can do as we gather weekly for worship. We must never, ever be satisfied with the ordinary routine 
of habitual gathering. This week, well, actually this morning, as I was praying, God reminded me of a story found in the book of Luke, I believe it is in chapter, I think it's 11, about a story of Martha and Mary. Jesus oftentimes, when he was traveling to Jerusalem, would stop at their home in Bethany, and he would visit with them. Well, this time he was teaching, and uh, you remember the story, a very familiar one about Jesus is teaching, and Martha is up doing the stuff, cooking and cleaning, I guess, whatever. It doesn't say what all she's doing. But anyway, Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus while he's teaching. And Martha goes to Jesus and says, she begins to complain. She says, Jesus, don't, why is Mary not helping me out, basically, is what she's saying. And Jesus tells Martha, Mary has chosen the good things. You have allowed distractions to keep you from the good things. So many times when we walk through the doors of this church, we're not here for the main purpose. We're here talking about what took place last night at the football games or what happened last night with my boyfriend or whatever. But we so often come with unclear minds, not focused on the purpose of the church, and that is to worship God. So today I want to talk to you about having the heart of worship. You know, there's a beautiful song that we sing sometimes here, and, and the title of it is A Heart of Worship. And I, I researched that song this week, and I'm going to give you the, the backstory about that song. The song was written by a, name, by a na man by the name of Matt Redman. And it was written in the late 1990s. Matt went to a Soul Survivor Church in uh, Watford, England. Like many of churches of that day and time, and some still today, they were struggling to find the real meaning of what church was. So one day the pastor did something very brave, I think. He decided to get rid of the sound system, to get rid of the worship team, and to strictly try to focus on God. His point was that they had lost their way in worship. And the way to get back to the heart of worship would be to strip everything hindering that away. So he wanted to remind the church family to be producers in worship, not consumers only. And that hit home with me because so many times I'm wanting God to bless me rather than me bless God. When we enter the doors of the church, we want to be blessed. But see, we're here to bless God. We're here to worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords, aren't we, guys? And we come in with distracted minds. We come in with the cares of the world, keeping us from doing what our main goal should be as we enter the doors of this church. So he asked the church this question. He said, when you come through the doors on Sunday, what are you bringing as your offering to God? The church responded first with silence. They didn't really like it, you might say. And, and, but eventually, he says, they began to really worship God, even as they sang a cappella songs, and, and they listened to the preaching of the word, and they, they entered into the prayers, you might say, of, of the, the church. So that they begin to worship in a, an inner, and encounter God in a fresh new way. And eventually, the, Bible, uh, the story goes on to say that eventually the pastor reintroduced uh, the musicians and the sound system. But by then, the church had regained a new perspective that worship is all about Jesus. And he commands a response in the depths of our souls no matter what our setting. And it was from that experience that Matt Redman wrote the song, Heart of Worship. I, I want to read just a, a few of the lyrics this morning about that song. Most of you know it because we sing it quite often, not all the time, but quite often. Listen to some of the lyrics. When the music fades and all is stripped away. And I simply come longing just to bring something 
that's of worth that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within. Through the ways things appear, you're looking into my heart. It's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. You know, so many times we use the word worship without really understanding what it means. The word worship is an old English song, I mean, it's an English word, excuse me, and is, is, an old, is an old English word which means worthship, worthship. It means to ascribe worth to someone. It is a feeling or expression of reverence and adoration. Why do we worship God? Because he is worthy. God sent his only son to die on Calvary's cross that we, we, people who sin and were full of sin might have life and might have life abundantly. You know, there's a beautiful story found in the book of Luke in chapter 7 about a woman in the Bible. And the Bible says that she was a woman of sin. And Jesus had been invited to a Pharisee's house. The Pharisee was a man by the name of Simon. And Jesus was invited to dinner to come to his house. He had been performing many miracles, and this Pharisee had seen what he was doing. So he invites Jesus to come to his house. So somehow this woman, the Bible says, sneaked into the house. She would have never been allowed into the house because she, that she was known in the city as a sinful woman. So she sneaks into the house, and as Jesus is reclining at the table, the Bible says that she begins to weep. And as she weeps, her t she allows her tears to fall upon Jesus' feet. And then she takes her hair and begins to wipe his feet with her hair. And then she anoints his feet with an a a alabaster jar of perfume, the Bible says. And Simon, the old Pharisee, like most of them, begins to admonish Jesus for allowing this woman to do this. He says, do you not realize that this woman is a woman of sin? But listen to the words of Jesus. He says, therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. She loved much. You know, in my mind, I see that as an act of worship. This woman realized who was in front of her, that she, and what she was doing, she was overwhelmingly showing an act of love to this Savior. She knew who Jesus was, and she knew what Jesus could do for her. You see, the inner essence of worship is to know God and then to respond to him. And we respond to him from a heart of knowing who he is and by valuing who he is, by treasuring who he is, by prizing who he is, by enjoying who he is, and by being satisfied with him and only him above everyone else. You see, this woman was ascribing worth to Jesus. When she did what she did, she was ascribing worth to her Savior. We worship God because he is worthy, because he is who he says he is, and he will do what he says he will do. So how do we worship God with our whole heart? You know, King David, the Bible says, was a man after God's own heart. And in Psalms chapter 9, I believe he gives us several ways that we can worship God with our own heart. He gives us four keys here, four keys that we can do to have a heart for God and to worship him every day of our life if we will only do these four things. In verse 1, listen to what he says. He says, I will praise you, O Lord, with all of my heart. 
Verse 2, the second thing of verse 1, he says, I will tell of your wonders. What does that say to us? Who are we sh supposed to share with, share God with, with people we come in contact with? Me? David says, I will tell of your wonders, what you've done for me, giving our testimony, you might say. The third thing, he says, I will be glad and rejoice in you. And then fourthly, he says, I will sing praise to your name, O Most High God. What David was saying here was that his praise to God was out of a heart of appreciation and understanding of God's worth to him. It was like saying thank you to the divine nature of God. You see, worth of worship is just an outward expression of an inward attitude that we should have, isn't it? We were created for one purpose, and that is to, to worship God and, and to give him honor and, and to give him praise. I love when Jerry prays because, you see, you know how Jerry closes every prayer. What does he say? I love you, dear God. We give you praise, honor, and glory. And that's what we should be doing, isn't it? We should be giving God praise, honor, and glory. The Psalms are full of worship. Psalm 66, 5 says, the, the psalmist says, Come and see what God has done. How awesome are his works on man's behalf. Most of the Psalms are prayers and in and in. Incorporated in those prayers are worship. Jeff talked about that Wednesday night. Fasting and prayers are a type of worship for us, aren't they? So praying, giving honor to God, giving praise to God, expresses admiration and appreciation for who God is and expresses thanks. And it's this through this type of worship that we can give God thanks, isn't it? You know, considering all that God's done for us and does for us, what could be more natural than an outburst of heartfelt praise and worship to him? When we gather in his name, our hearts should be so overwhelmed by what he's done for us that it should come automatically that the only thing we can do is to give him praise and honor and glory and worship him. Worship comes, as Jeff told us Wednesday night, worship comes in many forms, doesn't it? Not only do we sing praises to him, but we worship him through the preaching of his word, through the teaching of his word, through the giving back to him what he's blessed us with. You know, Jeff gets tired of uh, talking about that so many times, but hey, it's, it's a, w a way of worshiping God by returning to him just a portion of what he's blessed us with financially and physically and everything else. We worship him in our prayer time. As we respond to Jeff's message, we come to the altars and we worship God. We thank him for what he's doing in our life and what we want him to do in our life. And we, we worship him the, through the studying of his word. How many times, I, I can't count the number of times that, that I've been reading and studying God's word and and something in the word of god just blesses me you know I, I see something in a new and exciting way and and it just blesses my heart and i begin to praise god and to thank him for what he's showing me in his word so we worship him through the study of his word don't we in chapter four of john uh there's a very another very familiar story about jesus at meet, meeting a woman at the well you know the story uh, Jesus and his disciples are traveling through this part of the country and Jesus begins to stop at the well and to recline there and he tells his disciples to go on into town. There's a purpose for him. He knew what was going to take place. So a woman comes in in the middle of the day and she's coming in the middle of the day for a purpose because she doesn't come in the morning time when all the other people are coming, all the other women are coming to draw water from the well because she is, feels guilty about her sin. And as Jesus begins to converse with her, he begins to 
show her who he is and who she is. And when she realizes who he is, she begins to have this conversation with Jesus. And listen to what she says to him. She says, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but the Jews claim that the place we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus responds to that by telling her this, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. A time is coming and has come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. You see, God's not limited to a building or a synagogue, is he? Or any type of building. It's not where we worship, but it's how we worship. My question to you today, is your worship genuine and true? Are our responses to God for what he's done, is it coming from a heart of genuine worship and knowing who God is? Or are we just going through the motions so many times? And I'm as guilty as, as everybody. So many times when I come to church, I'm reliving the ball game from yesterday, or I've got where we're going to lunch on my mind, or I've been in a fight with my wife or my children. Not really. My children are gone. But I've, I've, in the past, I'm talking about, you know, you, by the time I got to church, I needed church so many times when my kids were growing up. But, when we come through these doors of this church, we need to leave the cares of the world behind, folks. We need to focus on one thing and one thing only, and that's Jesus. I'm gonna give you some practical steps to hope, hopefully will help each of us prepare for worship and in turn get us back to the heart of worship when we come. First of all, I think that we should learn to walk with God on a daily basis. You know, so many times when we get out into the, to the world doing our daily chores, going to work, going to school, and responding to people that we come in contact with, we forget about what's taking place on Sunday. We forget about what the commitments we've made on Sunday morning, don't we? We forget about who should be first priority in our life. And we allow the cares of the world and the struggles of life begin to affect us spiritually but paul says this in in first uh, first thessalonians chapter 5 verse 17 he says pray without ceasing why do you think he tells us that we need to be prayerful don't we every day not just on sundays but every day we need to be prayerfully thinking about who the king of king is and the lord of lord is not just on sundays he's to be our daily god He's not just to be a Sunday-only Jesus. He's to be a daily Jesus, isn't he? We need to take every spare moment that we have to thank God for who he is and to praise him. You know, when you're in the car, when you're going through that drive-thru, when you're talking to that person in that drive-thru, she may be in a bad mood. Most of them are this day and time. When you go to a restaurant, you know, they're under stress. Those people are. We can, we can relieve those stresses by being a blessing to the, those people. You know, when we go into the bank, no matter where we are, when that customer comes into our business, I know, Amy, you deal with a lot of those people. How do we respond to them? You know, Pray without ceasing. God, give me the right words to say to this person. You know, Let me be a blessing to someone today. I pray that every day as I go into my job. Let me be a blessing. Let me share Jesus in some way today. Let people see Jesus in me. We need to find one thing every day to give God thanks for. Find one thing and to constantly concentrate on what he's done. Give him praise for one thing that he's done for you in your life. Then when we come on Sunday morning, you know, it's just going to be a continuation of what's taking place in our life throughout the week. I think that takes place. But I think the most of the time, 
It's a continuation of the struggles and trials and tribulations that we bring on Sunday morning, and we can't worship God because of the things that we're allowing to control our life. You know, the fight I had with my boyfriend, maybe. Or, you know, things didn't go right at work today. I hate my job. So we're bringing all those cares of the world into the, to the building that we're supposed to worship God in. And we can't do that because of the cares of the world. Secondly, we need to learn to depend on God. Allow Him to be in control. To guide and to lead us in His way and in His time. That's basically what uh, Jeff was talking to us about what worship is. Allowing God to move in His time and in His way in our life. You know, one of my favorite scriptures in the entire Bible, and I've used this many times, is found in Second Peter chapter or First Peter chapter five verse seven, where he says, "Cast all your cares," and I love that word "all" in there. He says, "Cast all your cares on Him, because He cares for you." You know, carrying our worries and our stresses and our daily struggles by ourselves shows that we're not trusting God. You know, we're not trusting God fully with our life. It takes humility to trust God and to recognize that God cares enough about you and, and that he is interceding for you on a daily basis. The Bible says that he sits at the right hand of the Father interceding for you, his children. We, If nothing else, we should give him thanks for that. Sometimes we think that our struggles even though they may be caused by our own sin and our own craziness and our own foolishness, that God's not concerned about that just because we're carrying the weight of those stupid things, you might say, that we do. But when we trust God and we turn to Him in repentance, we, He then will help us bear the burdens of those struggles. Letting God have your anxieties calls for action. We cannot submit to the circumstances of the world and allow them to distract us from what we are here to do. We were created to worship God and to be mindful of that, of, of that every day. The third thing is that we need to learn to give sacrificial worship to Him. You see, many times life gets us down. I've been there. I know what it's like. and I know that the struggles of this life can can depress us and depress us and everything else. But life can get us down. And, and so many times we just don't feel like worshiping God. But we need, we need to make it a sacrifice daily to worship Him and to thank Him for what He's done. We don't really feel like celebrating who God is so many times. When we have struggles at, at school and kids are being unruly and the teachers are coming to us and they're complaining about this or complaining about that. We don't want to feel like worshiping God during those times, do we? But we need to make the sacrifice that we're going to worship God regardless of the, the circumstances. When God's people get together, great things can happen. That's why we gather on Sunday. Paul, I believe it was, who wrote the book of Hebrews, says... Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, all the more as you see the day coming nigh. So he's encouraging people to come to church, to worship him, to thank him for what, to bear one another's burdens. That's what we're supposed to do too, isn't it? Isaac Pennington, and I don't know who he is, I just read this this week, but Isaac Pennington says this, when people gather together for genuine worship, they are like a heap of fresh burning coals warming one another as a great strength and freshness and vigor of life that flows into all. There's a, a story found in the book of Genesis in chapter 22 about a man by the name of Abraham. And most of you should know this story already. But Abraham finally has a son by the name of Isaac. And Isaac, Isaac is a young boy. And one day God speaks to Abraham. And the Bible says it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, in 
And of course, Abraham responds, here I am. Then God says, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Can you imagine this? After all those years, God finally gives Abraham a son, and then he turns around and he tests Abraham and says, go, out, go sacrifice your own one and only son that I've finally given you to me. And listen to what Abraham does. This is a beautiful story. It says, so Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey, donkey, and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son. He split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. Can you imagine the dread in Abraham's life when he looks and sees that mountain that God just told him to carry his son to, to become a sacrifice? And here's the key, this next verse. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with a donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship. The lad and I will go yonder and worship. And we will come back. We will come back. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son and took the fire in his hand and a knife. And the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham his father. And he said, Abraham, my father, he said, here I am, my son. Then he said, look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the offering? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. And we know the rest of the story, how when he lays Isaac on the altar that he builds and puts him on the wood to, to basically kill Isaac, and God speaks to him, and they found, find a ram stuck in the, the bush, and he sacrifices a ram. But it's a beautiful story of how Abraham sacrifices to worship God. A well-known passage that centers on God's test of Abraham is devotion to him. And in essence, here's what Abraham's doing. Abraham expresses the ultimate act of sacrificial work Worth it, worship to God where he holds nothing back where he's willing to give it all to God he is showing in this story the, and exhibits the true heart of worship when he does his obedience to God so maybe this morning you see a need in your life to make some changes in the way we worship I have this week God's spoken to me in the way that I worship him. In the times that I've entered this sanctuary and not worshiped him, but let the cares of the world control my life. So maybe we need to get some priorities straightened out today. Maybe we haven't been walking with God on a daily basis. Maybe we've been depending on our own strength to get through the day. But like it says in John chapter 4, 24, it's time for us to worship him in spirit and in truth. And maybe it's time for us to get back to the heart of worship. I'm going to end today's lesson with some music. And what I want you to do is I just want you to bow your head. As we hear these songs, I want you to, you know, we used to sing this song in church. I hate these things. And 
Don't you hate those things? We used to sing this song in the Methodist church when I was there. It's called, We Have Come Into His House. Bow your heads with me and just listen as we 